PE with ABC um, courses with the um, emphasis on these lessons being um, intended to serve as scratching the surface, um, if you will, in terms of the, the material and the content, by no means will in an hour and, and a half, an hour and some change, will we fully and completely cover all that there is to cover when it comes to African independence movements in the 20th century, right? In, in the limited time that we do have, we're gonna do our best to, to cover as much as efficiently as possible. Um, but really, these PE with ABC lessons are intended to be the, the starting point for your own independent personal study on the topic, right? Um, and, and, you know, as African Black Coalition, we believe that political education, critical study, and overall uh, collective consciousness building need to be infused into our both our daily organizing as well as our daily personal lives. Um, so thank you all for tuning in. Um, my name is Makoni Tendaji. I am the political education director for the African Black Coalition. Welcome to PU ABC. Let's go ahead and get straight to it. And again, if at any point in time um, you have a question or you know I, I may be um, I may have skipped over something that you want to go back on. Please uh, just let me know in the chat box um, and then I'll, I'll do my best to adjust, right? So let's go ahead and get straight to it. Um, and what I would also like to sort of touch on is in fielding the responses for, or are not doing the responses, um, collecting the registrations, um, registration forms, a lot of folks input that they wanted to learn about pre-colonial African societies and pre-colonial African history. While we won't cover that particular area of history in this lesson, we will certainly incorporate pre-colonial African history within our political education moving forward, right? That's definitely very crucial um, to cover, right? Um, so the topic for this evening, again, is revolutionary organizing African independence movements. This um, is a, very, very, very wide um, reaching global, um, a, a globally reaching um, and complex topic. Again, by no means will we cover everything that there is to know about African independence movements in the 20th century in the time that we have here with PU with ABC. So it's going to be up to each and every one of us who are tuned in now to not only do further study and research for ourselves, but also engage with our peers and our, you know, our um, fellow African people in the study of this topic, because it's far too important um, to think, oh, you know, I learned everything I needed to know um, during P with ABC. That, that isn't, that just isn't, that isn't our uh, objective, right? To, to try to cover an entire uh, field of study in an hour and some change, right? Um, so just a brief overview. Um, we're going to have a little opening uh, uh, teaching from an ancestor. We're going to cover colonialism 101, just the real basics of what it is and, and how it operates. And then we're going to look at um, several studies. And what I mean by case studies are African independence movements and organizations need to be studied critically um, in their own respective time period and in their own respective uh, 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 space in history as well as compared and contrasted with each other when we study this topic overall, right? Um, so the case studies are as follows. We have Kwame Nkrumah and CPP. Kwame, uh, CPP stands for Convention People's Party, uh, which was the dominant political party um, at the, the, the birth of Ghana as an independent nation, as well as the, the peak um, of Ghana's independence. And then we have Thomas Sankara and Burkina Faso, Steve Biko in South Africa, Emil Carr Cabral and the African Party for um, the Independence of Guinea and Cape Verde. Um, Guinea and Cape Verde are West African nations, right? And then we have Samora Michelle and Mozambique. Mozambique is a southeastern um, or more of a, a southern um, country um, on the continent. And then we will also be covering neocolonialism 101, so similar to colonialism 101, the real basics, um, the machinations of it, the way that it operates. Um, contemporarily as well as the way it operated historically and then a closing teaching. Um, so I'm, I'm excited for this, definitely. Um, again, it's such a broad topic that, you know, in preparation for 
it's a nice lesson. I, I knew that I couldn't attempt to put together a presentation that encompassed the entire topic because that presentation would have been hundreds of slides long, right? And we, we don't, it isn't feasible to try to get through all of that in one sitting, right? So the opening teaching from an ancestor we are referring to comes from Thomas Sankara. He says that the imperialism we are fighting is not an isolated thing, it's a system. As revolutionaries from a dialectical point of view, we should understand that we too should have a system. You have to counter a system with a system, an organization with an organization, not simply individuals full of goodwill, good sentiments, honesty, courage, and generosity. The imperialist system, which is worldwide and not located in this or that country, has to be fought with an entire system that we will forge together. This is a masterful teaching from our ancestor. And, and I put this um, particular sentence in red because it, I believe it rings so true, especially in, in current times, right? That oftentimes what um, many of our people will um, sort of raise as questions or concerns is, what do we do, right? How, how, do, we, how do we get our people out of this condition? Thomas Sankara is urging us that the conditions and the systems that we are faced up against are not individuals in and of themselves. Therefore, we cannot hope to organize and fight for our freedom as individuals. We have to counter and, and wage um, counter attacks, right? Counter offensives on systems with our own systems, with our own organizations with people in those organizations who understand that the organization comes before themselves as an individual, right? It isn't enough to just have um, numerous individuals, as he says, right, full of goodwill, good sentiments, because oftentimes even those well-meaning individuals end up doing more damage or more uh, 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 unconstructive um, work, right, rather than being constructive and, and actually executing effectively different measures and action for the betterment of our people. So we have to really keep this in mind that we are fighting a system, therefore we must counter it with a system of our own. We must organize and get into organizations to wage, right, or, or first to defend ourselves, right, and then to also wage counter offensives against our enemy organizations, right. So on to um, colonialism 101, just the basics. Um, so the the a short, simple definition is the control by individuals or groups over the territory and or behavior of other individuals or groups. Plain and simple. The way that we will frame tonight's lesson has to do with two major types of colonialism. We have exploitation colonialism and settler colonialism. So let's get into the distinction to be made. So exploitation colonialism refers to um, national economic policy of conquering a country to exploit its population as labor and its natural resources as raw material, right? The goal in exploitation colonialism is to exploit the weaker country's natural resources and extract as much wealth as possible. Prominent examples of exploitation colonialism are King Leopold II and Belgium Caesar, Caesar of the Congo. We also had the island of Jamaica, as well as the island of Haiti, right? There's a very um, critical component of studying our history that we need to be sure we are maintaining. And that is to identify clearly the systems and institutions that our enemies build, right, in order to reinforce their subjugation of our people, right? It, it, it is um, but the tip of the iceberg, figuratively speaking, to suggest, oh, um, African black people are, are just oppressed because of our skin color or African black people um, just need to, to you know, um, do for ourselves and, and stop relying on, right, white people or whomever we're, we're you know, talking about to, to, to do for ourselves what we can do, right? We need to be sure we are clearly identifying the, the distinctions made that need to be made in terms of the types of systems and ideologies and organizations that are employed by our enemies, right? Um, then we have settler colonialism. This is the replacement of indigenous populations with an invasive settler system that over time develops a distinctive identity and sovereignty. Settler collectives intend to permanently occupy and assert sovereignty over indigenous lands. Settler colonial invasion is a structure, not an event. 
Settler colonialism persists in the ongoing elimination of indigenous populations and the assertion of state sovereignty and judicial control over their land. So you can see in these two distinct types of colonialism, they are they are very different and some there are similarities of course but they are very very different you can think of these two different types of colonialism as exploitation means the colonizer does not live where they are colonizing in settler colonialism the colonizer lives in the place that they are colonizing and they don't intend to leave examples of settler colonies are these united states of america right israel and south africa focus on the the points being made here right replacement of indigenous populations settler colonial invasion being a structure and not an event oftentimes we we run the risk of framing the um enslavement of our ancestors as just this one uh, uh occurrence in history that's an error because we see settler colonialism is actually a structure and and ideologies are embedded in this structure and they are reinforced over time so it isn't just one event or two events, it becomes embedded in that society. So we, we need to understand clearly, the United States of America is a settler colony. It, it, it has been from its inception, right? And then just some teachings from some, from some of our ancestors um, on this, this, this um, subject of colonialism, right? So Franz Fanon, book The Wretched of the Earth says that colonialism hardly ever exploits the whole of a country it connects itself with bringing to light the natural resources, which it extracts and exports to meet the needs of the mother country's industries, thereby allowing certain sectors of the colony to become relatively rich, but the rest of the colony follows its path of underdevelopment and poverty, or at all events, sinks into it more deeply. Just from this teaching alone, we can get a very, very clear picture painted for us in terms of how colonialism operates. As Francis Fanon says, right, it is not um, uh, total indiscriminate domination where the entire land is colonized and there is no sense of uh, uh, freedom, quote unquote, if you will, right? He says that certain sectors of the colony are actually allowed to, to become relatively rich. We can take this teaching and apply it to these United States of America as a settler colony and say certain sectors of US society are allowed to right, maintain relative wealth and, and obtain relative riches. We can think of the entertainment industry. Uh, we can think of professional sports. We can think of higher education, of course, not to the benefit of students or, or faculty. Various sectors of United States society right, fall right into this description that Franz Fanon gives in terms of how colonialism operates. right. Kwame Nkrumah also says that the social effects of colonialism are more insidious than the political and economic. This is because they go deep into the minds of the people and therefore take longer to eradicate. This is very crucial to understand, especially when it comes to the various problems and issues that plague our people and our communities. Colonialism is a highly complex, right? system. It's a highly complex uh, 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 means by which one, one group of people gains superiority, right, and, and wealth, and another group, right, is, is driven into subjugation and oppression. Kwame Nkrumah is saying that while there are political and economic effects of colonialism, the social effects need to be treated as the most deadly, as the most uh, 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 destructive to the minds of our people, right? So, um, on to our first case study. We have Kwame Nkrumah and the Convention People's Party of Ghana. On this, this left image, you see that is where Ghana is located on the African continent. Then we have our mighty ancestor in the middle image, right? Kwame Nkrumah himself. And then on the right, we have an actual, this is an actual um, image of the Convention People's Party. Um, their um, logo is a rooster, I believe. Um, their slogan was forward ever, backwards never, right? And th this is the, the promotional image, if you will, of the political party. So just some basic information. And again, by no means is this the everything you need to know about Kwame Nkrumah and everything you need to know about 
the Convention of People's Party of Ghana. No, there's definitely more thorough research to be done on the topic. So the party was founded by Kwame Nkrumah in 1949. Ghana earned their independence in 1957. Um, the, the, the political party served as a vehicle of emancipation of the nation and the whole of Africa. Um, it is characterized as a mass party that embraces farmers, fishermen, rural folks, the rich and the poor alike, all of the conviction that you cannot have a nation that is half marginalized and half affluent. What you will see often in um, revolutionary organizing on the African continent, generally speaking, of course, you will see a, a incredibly thorough class analysis infused into the organizing politics and into the organizing itself, right? Um, CPP is a prime example of a political party that organized the people with the the objective being to bring all the different people onto the same uh, uh, level, if you will, right, socioeconomically, right. And this comes from this uh, quote right here comes from Kwame Nkrumah's book Africa Must Unite. He says that the Convention People's Party represented the ordinary common folk who wanted social justice and a higher standard of living. It kept in daily living touch with the ordinary mass of people it represented, unlike the opposition, which was supported by a galaxy of lawyers and members of other conservative professions, the self-styled aristocracy of the Gold Coast. They did not understand the new mood of the people, the growing nationalism, and the revolt against economic hardship. Thinking that their lofty assertions were enough to win adherence to their ranks, they may little to come into close contact with the masses. Here, Kwame Nkrumah is articulating the real critical um, teaching of it is the job of political parties and political organizations. And to be clear, we are not referring to political parties in the, the American sense of Democratic and Republican Party. That's electoral politics. That's a whole other conversation for another day. What Kwame Nkrumah is articulating here is that it is the duty of political parties and political organizations to keep in daily consistent contact with the masses of the people. Right, he says it, the ordinary common folk, not the, not the petty bourgeois um, folks, right? Not those who, who occupy particular um, social and economic positions, right? That, that are above the masses. The focus always, the, the heart always is the mass of our people, right? And we are going nowhere in any movement or any organizing without the masses in the center and the masses in the front, right? Um, this information, this is actually very powerful um, to learn about in terms of Kwame Nkrumah's uh, uh, organizing history, right? So this is describing his introduction into um, Pan-Africanism and, or not Pan-Africanism, but his introduction into the Pan-African Congress as a prominent uh, uh, gathering, right, of Pan-Africanists and intellectuals. This comes from uh, Manning Marable's book, African and Caribbean Politics. He says that Nkrumah immersed himself in preparations for Padmore as George Padmore. George Padmore's fifth Pan-African Congress, which was held in October 1945 in Manchester. Through Padmore, Nkrumah met Yomo Kenyatta, South African writer Peter Abrahams, and Pan-African militant, Pan-Africanist militant Ross McConan. Padmore and Nkrumah served as joint secretaries of the organizing committee. And Krumah recalled later, we worked night and day in George's flat. We used to sit in this small kitchen, the wooden table completely covered with papers, a pot of tea which we always forgot until it had been made two or three hours, and George typing at his small typewriter so fast that the papers were churned out, churned out as though they were being rolled off a printing press. I just think this is a very powerful image that is being painted by our ancestor to really get an idea of the daily uh, work that went into things as, as, as important as the Pan-African Congress. The fifth, the fifth Pan-African Congress is arguably the most important of all of the Pan-African Congresses themselves. I believe there are a total of seven. Um, this one is the most important because in 1945, when it occurred from 1945 to 1960, 15 short years, you had organizing had independence movements that, that sprang up, right? It almost was like a, a, a fire had been set ablaze the entire African continent in a positive way, right? Our people all across the continent 
it seemed on the dawn of this Pan-African Congress, stood up and began to organize and eventually earn their freedom and their independence, right? Um, the Manchester Congress marked Nkrumah's arrival as a potential leader of a major current in the African independence movement. For the first time, Nkrumah wrote in 1957, the delegates who attended it were practical men and men of action and not, as was the case of the four previous conferences, merely idealists contenting themselves with writing theses, but quite unable or unwilling to take any active part in dealing with the African problem. By 1946 and 1947, Nkrumah now Kwame had become second only to Padmore, the best known figure amongst the African anti-colonialist activists living in England. So you can see here, Kwame Nkrumah is articulating a very important notion that the objective of mass organization should not be solely to theorize and you know ponder and think about the conditions of our people the goal should be okay theorize think about right ponder and then develop tangible actions and programs right as a result of being informed by that theorizing right build tangible programs and actions to actually transform the material conditions of the poor and working class masses of the people. That should always be the sort of uh, one-two combo, if you will, whenever there's, there's um, organizing to be done, right? That, that merging of theory and practice. You need both. So it isn't enough to rely solely on practice because you're not informed by theory. But we also cannot just sit cooped up with our books theorizing all day and all night while our people remain in the conditions that they remain in. Um, in 1964, Malcolm X lectured at the, at the Kwame Nkrumah Ideological Institute at Waniba and was permitted to present a speech before the parliament. He wrote later in his autobiography that the, the highest single honor he had experienced in all of Black Africa was an audience with Nkrumah. We discussed the unity of Africans and people of African descent. We agreed that Pan-Africanism was the key also to the problems of those of African heritage. Toward the last years of his life, Nkuma called for the creation of African revolutionary parties based on an alliance with the, of the peasantry, rural proletariat wage workers, and the revolutionary intelligentsia. Kwame Nkuma can be considered one of the pioneers and one of the uh, uh, most important proponents of Pan-Africanism as an ideology and Pan-Africanism as an, as an action, right? Um, he says that socialist revolution is impossible without, without the use of force. Revolutionary violence is a fundamental law in revolutionary struggles. So that was Kwame Nkrumah in the CPP of Ghana, right? Now, we, now we're moving on to Thomas Sankara and Burkina Faso. You can see the map on the right. That is where Burkina Faso is located just above Ghana. And then on the left, we have our beautiful ancestor, Thomas Sankara himself. Um, so May 20th through the 22nd, 1983, so this is about 30, between 25 and 30 years um, after, right, the, the peak of Kwame Nkrumah and Ghana, right, gaining their independence. You had mass demonstrations against the neocolonial regime. Um, these demonstrations were concrete proof of the people's, all, uh, and above all, of our youth's commitment to the revolutionary ideas defended by the men whose reaction had treacherously brought down. Right, so 1983 is a critical year in Burkina Faso's history as well as the entire African continent's history, right? When we look at how demonstrations and organizations use the, the um, catalyst, right, of neocolonialism to really drive their efforts, right, to organize and secure freedom for the people, right? So move to August 4th, 1983, this is considered the August Revolution. It is a revolution in a country which changed from colony to neo-colony under the domination and exploitation of imperialism. It is a revolution in a country which still lacks an organized and militant working class with a conception of a historical mission. We have no tradition of revolutionary struggle. Our revolution was born in a tiny country and at a time when the international revolutionary movement is withering day by day without any immediate hope of forming itself into a block to encourage or support young revolutionary movements. The August, the August Revolution is a democratic one. Its first tasks are, end, are the ending of imperialist domination and exploitation, purging of social, economic, cultural habits, which keep our country in its backward state. It will be built on the involvement of all the people. This comes directly from Thomas Sankara himself and his book, The Political Orientation, 
of Burkina Faso. So here he defines clearly what the August Revolution was and its importance. And again, we see the common underlying theme that when it comes to mass organization, it needs to be just that, the masses of people being organized. He says here, right, the August Revolution will be built involvement of all the people. This is, this is, this is a, a direct correlation, right, to what Kwame Nkrumah articulated, right? The revolution's object is to give the people power. That is why the very first act of the revolution after the August 4th proclamation was to call on the people to form revolutionary defense committees, the revolution defense committees. The National Revolutionary Council believes that for this to be truly a re people's revolution, it must destroy the neocolonial state machinery and organize a new machine which guarantees the people's sovereignty. The question of just how that power will be exercised or how it should be organized is the primary question the revolution must confront. While making the revolution, we must at the same time transform our own personal quality without such personal transformation of those who set out to build the revolution it will be practically impossible to create a new society which does not run on corruption, theft, lies, and individualism. We have to bring our acts into line with our words and study our own behavior so we are not open to attack from counter-revolutionaries. If we keep constantly in mind that the interests of the people come before our own, we will not make mistakes. Some militants dream the dreams of counter-revolutionaries hoping to profit from the CDRs. They have to be denounced and fought against. We have no room for stars or publicity seekers. The quicker such tendencies are stamped out, the better for the revolution. We have no room for, or to, you, to us, the revolutionary is someone who knows how to be modest, but is also completely dedicated in the tasks given to him. He or she carries through the tasks without showing off and without expecting any return. These come directly from um, Thomas Sankara himself, right? And this is such a um, profound um, excerpt from this book that he wrote because he covers so many points, right? He speaks on the need for a people's revolution to destroy the machinery, he uses the word, right? to destroy the machinery of the neocolonial state and organize a new machine, right? There's, the, there's again that, that theme of countering a system with a system, right? He also says that we, we must transform our own personal quality so we cannot involve ourselves in the uh, uh, freedom work of African black people if we are not incorporating that work into our daily lives. He also goes into saying that we have no room for stars or publicity seekers. I remember when I first read this, I was like, whoa, he, he, he is speaking on a, an issue that is, in my, in my judgment, so relevant today um, when you look at the real uh, uh, illness of opportunism when it comes to, the, the, to, to rallying around, right, the, the deaths of our people, particularly here in the United States, right, Black men in particular, right, when we look at the disproportionate rates of those um, black people who are killed by the police, right? Um, this notion of having no room for stars or publicity seekers, I believe really needs to be driven home in our organizing spaces that, that any of our people who intend to get into the organizing um, realm for their own publicity or to become famous is, one, is an individual to be, to be monitored. Um, to be watched and, and not afforded too much space or power or authority too soon. Um, he says it, right? They have to be denounced and fought against, period. Um, so yeah, th these are excerpts from that book. Um, he really lays out clearly um, various critical concepts that need to not only be learned, right, but taught and reinforced. He goes on to talk about how the philosophy of revolutionary transformation will take, will take over in the following sector. There are three sectors he outlines, right? He says that there's the national army, the politics of women, and the economic transformation or building the economy itself, right? These three sectors are very, very important to think about and to analyze critically for ourselves, right? How can incorporating that philosophy of revolutionary transformation, how can that positively and constructively impact these sectors, right? He says that our revolution is in the interests of all those who are oppressed, 
or exploited in the society we have today. Women's domination by men comes fundamentally from the political and economic structures of our society. The revolution changing the social order which oppresses women will create the conditions for her true emancipation. The CNR realizes that building an independent, self-sufficient, planned national economy means a radical transformation of our society. It means the following major reforms, land reform, administrative reform, educational reform of production and distribution in the modern sector of the economy. All the shackles of traditional socioeconomic structures which oppress peasants must be abolished. Again, Thomas Sankara, truthfully, for, for, for lack of a better term, Thomas Sankara is getting in his bag, right? He, he's really getting loose in terms of studying the philosophy of evolutionary transformation. And then from that study, right, figuring out where that can be applied. In the case of Burkina Faso's revolution, which is he identified were the national army, the politics of women, and economic transformation, right? This is very, very important for us to really do in-depth study on. He also goes on to articulate solidarity and strong support for other national liberation movements, right? And this is critical. Whenever we engage in the study of Pan-Africanism, Black nationalism, the radical organizing history of Black college students, right? There is a commonality in that study, and that's the, the global level of critical awareness and consciousness when it comes to organizing, when it comes to uh, engaging in freedom work all of the prominent organizations and individuals in those organizations throughout our history have had that critical global level of awareness and consciousness in terms of the global right, impacts on our people across the world. Never in our history have we experienced right, a prominent uh, uh, African black organization that was solely focused on where they lived, the, the land that they occupied. All of the most prominent and most effective and, and most significant organizations were those who understood, okay, we are going to struggle, we are going to build, we are going to organize where we are, where we physically, you know, are present, wherever that may be, the United States, the African continent, the UK, Brazil, wherever you want to, you know, be on the, on the globe while also doing a, 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 an intentional and thorough job of studying, right, the global conditions of all African Black people across the world in order to better be informed at how to merge those struggles, how to connect those efforts. Because it, it is essentially by uh, adopting tunnel vision and, and not wanting to uh, incorporate global awareness in your organizing is to refuse reinforcements in an army or to refuse reinforcements in a war that you are losing, right? So if you're engaged in, in warfare against an enemy and you are being beaten and, and your forces are retreating, here come a, a, a wave of reinforcements and they say, hey, you know, we're fighting the same enemy, right? Well, here we are. But, you know, by, by limiting your awareness and, and neglecting the global level, you just say, no, no, this is our struggle. This is our fight. Y'all good. It's illogical to limit, right, to refuse the, the possibility of incorporating more reinforcements, more troops in your battle by simply adopting the mentality of global consciousness and global study, you are now opening the door, right, to those new reinforcements, right, to come and wage war with you, alongside you. That needs to be the, the real uh, uh, way that we frame, right, what that means. And so he, he identifies various people, right? He says the people of Namibia, right? He says the, the Saharan people, he says the Palestinian people, the national rights, right? He says that in our struggle, the anti-imperialist African countries are our objective allies, right? 
So now moving on um, to Steve Biko in South Africa. As you can see, there's our mighty ancestor on the left. On the right, that is where South Africa is located on the continent. So a, a key uh, um, concept or ideology to associate with Steve Biko would be that of black consciousness, right? And on this, Steve Biko himself writes, thus in all fields, black consciousness seeks to talk to the black man in a language that, his, that is his own. It is only by recognizing the basic setup in the black world that one will come to realize the urgent need for a reawakening of the sleeping masses. Black consciousness seeks to do this. He goes on to say, in order to achieve real action, you must yourself be a living part of Africa and of her thought. You must be an element of that popular energy, which is entirely called forth for the freeing, the progress, and the happiness of Africa. There is no place outside that fight for the artist or for the intellectual who is not himself concerned with and completely at one with the people in the great battle of Africa and of suffering humanity. So again, Steve Biko contributes to the importance, right, to the idea behind why it's important to, to, to incorporate a global awareness in your study and in your organizing, right? He says that you must yourself be a living part of Africa and be an element of that energy, right? I just think that, that that's, that's worded so impeccably, really. And with black consciousness, the ideology, you have the black, you have black consciousness as a movement, right? And it says here, the black consciousness movement urged a defiant rejection of apartheid, especially among black workers and youth. The South African Students Organization, an arm of the movement also founded by Steve Biko, uh, was founded by black students who refused to join uh, NUSAS, another student-led organization. I believe this stands for National um, Unity of South African Students. At the same time, black workers began to organize trade unions in defiance of anti-strike laws. In 1973, there were strikes throughout the nation in cities like Durban. The collapse of Portuguese colonialism and the victories of the Mozambique Front, which we will be learning about very shortly in Mozambique, and the popular mo movement for the liberation of Angola in, uh, in Angola stimulated further activity against apartheid. This culminated in the Soweto uprising of 1976. So again, black consciousness as a, as, a, as a political thought, as well as black consciousness as a movement, right, originate from South Africa and from the mind of Steve Biko and other South Africans at the time. Oh, this is, this is major, this is important. On the notion of integration, um, this is very uh, relevant in my judgment, right? This is what Steve Biko uh, offers in terms of his position um, and his analysis of um, integration. He says, if by integration, you understand a breakthrough into white society by blacks and assimilation and acceptance of blacks into an already established set of norms and code of behavior set up by and maintained by whites, then yes, I am against it. I am a superior, inferior, white black stratification that makes the white a perpetual teacher and the black a perpetual pupil and a poor one at that. I am against the intellectual arrogance of white people that makes them believe that white leadership is a sine qua non in this country and that whites are the divinely appointed pace setters in progress. And sine qua non is, is Latin for something deemed absolutely necessary. He goes on to say, I am against the fact that a settler minority should impose an entire system of values on an indigenous people. If on the other hand, by integration, you mean there shall be free participation by all members of a society catering for the full expression of the self in a freely changing society as determined by the will of the people, then I am with you. For one cannot escape the fact that the culture shared by the majority group in any given society must ultimately determine the broad direction taken by the joint culture of that society. Steve Vigo gets in his bag with this. And the reason why I, I believe this is important for us to study and to really, you know, uh, uh, embrace as a teaching is, again, when we talk about making critical distinctions in terms of how we uh, um, conceptualize the ways in which we are oppressed and subjugated, right? But to, to simply say, we're 
color of our skin is to adopt a very basic uh, level of analysis of our enemies. The same goes for integration, right? We can't just think of um, this as a, a plain um, dichotomy between integration and separation, right? Or integration and segregation. And what Steve Biko is articulating here was also expressed, right, by uh, Africans here, you know, right in America, Malcolm X being a prominent example on why integration in this particular uh, 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 definition should absolutely be opposed, right, by the masses of black people. He says that he is against the superior, inferior white black stratification. And you can see that was absolutely the result of many of the integrationist uh, efforts and movements, right, at least in, in, in the United States in the 20th century. So this is very important um, to remember in terms of the intellectual legacy of African independence movements of Pan-Africanism. So now on to the organization that um, Steve Biko and a group of black students in South Africa founded, the South African Students Organization. Their founding Congress was held in July of 1969 with Biko being elected the first president. Um, in his presidential address, he lays out the reasons why the organization was founded and basically what their objectives were, right? And, and he, what he did so beautifully was articulate the objectives laid out by SASO, right? And, and how they, as an organization, they objected, right, the, the um, sort of perpetuation of white participation in um, black freedom efforts and black life. Remember, this is South Africa, right? Apartheid is, is, is prevalent, right? Segregation is, is, is state sanctioned <laughs> and reinforced, right? Steve Biko was articulating is the need to have, right, black led and black only populated organizations, right? He says that it, it, it is in, it isn't feasible to try to um, build rainbow coalitions, right, in an apartheid state. And then, um, this is actually a, a, a pretty uh, neat fact, if you will. Um, so within the African Black Coalition, we have bureaus, the Political Education and Organizing Office, right, which I'm a director of, along with uh, uh, my comrade, Rafilwe, she's the Political Organizing Director our office is housed under the Black Community Programs Bureau. The Black Community Programs Bureau of the African Black Coalition was directly inspired by Black Community Programs of South Africa, right? Um, so that was, that's just a cool uh, kind of fact there. So um, the Black Consciousness Movement um, built this branch of community activities, right? And called it Black Community Programs, right? In January of 1972, this branch embarked on projects, right, community, develop, community development programs, right. Steve Biko himself um, quit medical school in August of 1972 and became heavily involved in BCP activities, right. He says that essentially to answer the problem that the black man is a defeated being who finds it very difficult to lift himself up by his bootstraps. He is alienated. He is made to live all the time concerned with matters of existence, concerned with tomorrow. Now we felt that we must attempt to defeat and break this kind of attitude and instill once more a sense of dignity within the black man. So what we did was to design various types of programs, present these to the black community with an obvious illustration that, that, that these are done by the black people for the sole purpose of uplifting the black community. We believe that we teach people by example, right? Uh, so now moving on to uh, Amil Carl Cabral, um, the PAIGC and Guinea and Kate Verde, you see, um, Oh, that's kind of loud. My brother Roland Bile, his, what is the big old motorcycle? Brother <laughs> was smooth with it. Um, Emil Conquer Brawl is on the left there. In the middle, you have um, the political party, PAIGC, -P that's their flag. And then on the right, these, these tiny uh, marks right here, right, represent Guinea, 
Guinea is the, the one connected to the continent, and then you have the islands of Cape Verde. Um, so the African Party for the Independence of Guinea and Cape Verde was established in 1956. They spent their early years doing political work in the cities, and then after the year 1959, their focus shifted to the countryside, right? On this shift, um, Emil Carl Cabral articulates, on the basis of our party's life, we want to destroy every possibility of those who can liberate our land or any others only to come abuse our people tomorrow. Our objective cannot be to go and tend to the governor's palace only to do in our land what the governor would like to do. Our objective is to break with the colonial state in our land to create a new state different on the basis of justice, work, and equality of opportunity for all the children of our land in Guinea and Cape Verde. So it's important also to look into the uh, significance of him, uh, of, the, of Cabral himself and the political party shifting from the cities to the countryside, right? And, and how this was done in the spirit of their objective of breaking with the colonial state, right? To create a new one, right? Because what they understood was the more that you entrench yourself in the institutions and machinations of your enemies, you, you, uh, uh, you become more like them, right? It's like the African proverb, right? Proverb, right? Um, he who argues with a fool uh, for too long ends up becoming one. Assimilation breeds association, right? To break away with the colonial state requires a, a physical geographical shift away from the, the centralized locations and headquarters, right? of your enemies and institutions, right? This is very critical. Fighting, taking up arms, and going on strike are too easy, but fighting with arms in one's hands isn't enough. It's necessary to struggle with political consciousness in one's head. It's that we be aware that it's the consciousness of a man that guides the gun and not the gun that guides his consciousness. The gun counts because the man is behind it, grasping it, and it's worth more the more the consciousness of the man is worth the more the man's consciousness serves a well-defined, clear, and just cause. We have to clearly define our political consciousness because the enemy exerts political pressure in order to destroy our political resistance. As much inside as outside our land, we have to clearly define our political resistance, what we should do. There is a lot we need to define. Whoever doesn't know that, if they don't know, it's because it didn't concern them to know it well. Emil Cabral flames this, this notion right of critical definition to resistance as well as the importance of consciousness informing struggle consciousness informing fighting right and actually waging war taking up arms right this is so um i don't want to say prophetic this is so um insightful right because we can we can think of various periods in time contemporarily where a uh an incident occurred right a, a spark was lit and without considering the building of critical consciousness without considering definitions to resistance action was simply taken right Re in, a, in a reactionary sense as a people we cannot afford to be reactionary because what that ultimately does is right it ends up actually hindering the tangible constructive progress we need to be engaged in, right, as a collective of people. What Emil Cockerball is articulating here is so cool. He says, there is a lot we need to define. And, and I believe this to be true today, especially when it comes to discussing conditions and problems in our communities. And in every single one of those discussions and dialogues, there's always that question brought up of, well, what can we do, right? What, what's the solution? That's a signal that there is still a lot of critical study and definition to be done, definition to our resistance, definition to our enemies and the ways in which they suppress us and subjugate us, right? And there needs to be a more critical emphasis placed on the building of critical consciousness for that consciousness to then fuel resistance, right? Oftentimes we make the mistake of assuming they are um, two separate silos. You have this, and then you have the fighting, 
you have the thinking and then you have the practicing. No, no, no. The goal needs to be a, an effective synthesis of the two, right? For those who say today, oh, we don't, you know, we, we do too much reading. I would argue vehemently that we don't do nearly enough as a mass of people. And that isn't to blame any of us. That's to say that isn't true. We need to do more studying and more reading, right? He says it here. It's necessary that we be aware it's the consciousness of a man that guides the gun and not the gun that guides his consciousness. We can't, we can't simply think, oh, all we got to do is black people is, is, is get straps, right? All we got to do is buy guns. We, we certainly don't have a, a, a um, gun ownership problem <laughs> in our communities, right? You can go to any hood in the United States, anywhere in the globe, and the people who live there know where to get guns. Picking up arms isn't the issue. The issue is how, to, how do we build collective critical consciousness to adequately inform the way that we fight, the way that we take up arms, the way that we resist. That needs to be the goal. And that's what Amir Kakabra is articulating here, right? So on the notion of armed struggle, it was waged against Portuguese colonialism and in 1963 is when it started, right? They conducted guerrilla warfare and armed insurrection across the country. And within 10 years, they achieved control over most of Guinea's territory and declared independence. They were supremely successful in terms of guerrilla warfare and their liberation was in no small part due to Cabral's leadership and foresight into grassroots politics, diplomacy, and livelihood improvement. Um, this comes from one of Amir Cabral's speeches um, the Weapon of Theory is the name of the speech. He says that we are not going to use this platform to rail against imperialism. An African saying, very common in our country says, when your house is burning, it's no use beating the tom-toms. On a tri-continental level, this means that we are not going to eliminate imperialism by shouting insults against it. For us, the best or worst shout against imperialism, whatever its form, is to take up arms and fight. This is what we are doing, and this is what we will go on doing until all foreign domination of our African homelands has been totally eliminated. I love that 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 uh, saying, right? When your house is burning, it's no use beating the tom toms. <laughs> this idea needs to be critically studied and applied in our organizing spaces today, right? And this is not to uh, uh, discredit or downplay the very critical dialogue in terms of studying imperialism and neocolonialism, right? But again, there needs to be a proper understanding of the necessity for a synthesis between theory, dialogue, debate, and practice, organizing, fighting, resisting, right? This is Emil Cocker Ball saying this is something that can, that can certainly be embraced by us as African people today and in our organizing spaces. So now moving on to uh, some more of Michelle um, and Free Limo. I'm gonna just say Free Limo and Mozambique. That's him on the left. In the middle, you have um, a promotional image of the uh, uh, Liberation Front. And then you have on the right where Mozambique is located on the continent. So in 1962, Michel joined the Front for the Liberation of Mozambique, or Free Limo, as it was called by most. Free Limo was dedicated to creating an independent Mozambique. In 1963, a year later, Samoa Michel left Mozambique and traveled to several other African nations where he received military training. In 1964, he returned to Mozambique and led Free Limo's first guerrilla attack against the Portuguese in northern Mozambique. He spent most of his time in the field with his men, leading them in combat and sharing their dangers and hardships. By 1970, Samoa Michel became commander and chief of the Free Limo Army. He believed in the guerrilla war and, and, and their army established themselves at, among the poor in Mozambique. He was a revolutionary who was not only dedicated to throwing the Portuguese out of Mozambique, but also radically changing the society. Samoa Michel is one of my favorite African revolutionaries because he is a prime embodiment of what it means to critically study teach and lead the people while never leaving the people, while never leaving the front lines, right? He received training, right? And he very, he, he just as easily could have um, been a, a, you know, a, a commander or a, a 
a general and just coordinated attacks and launched them, you know, remotely. He made the choice to spend his time in the field, on the front line, right, in combat, understanding the importance of what that does as a leader, right? He said that of all the things we have done, the most important, the one that history will record as the principal contribution of our generation is that we understand how to turn the armed struggle into a revolution, that we realized that it was essential to create a new mentality, to build a new society. This is a... a, a similarity to what Amilcar Cabral was articulating, right, in terms of the objective is to break away from the colonial state and build our own. The objective is not to um, reform or, or um, change from within the colonial state and its institutions. No, the goal is to break away from it and destroy it while effectively building our own. This, this same uh, notion is applied, right, to the liberation work in Mozambique. So the Mozambique Liberation Front itself was founded in 1962, aims to combat poverty and reduce social imbalances, fight corruption and increase national unity. Opposition to Portuguese rule by Africans under traditional rulers had persisted well into the 20th century, reflecting in part the belated efforts of Portugal to establish an effective administration over the country's hinterlands and in part the harshness of life for the Africans under company management and colonial administration. So Portuguese colonialism colonialism is a prime example of settler colonialism. Again, the colonizers live where they are colonizing, right? So in the case of Mozambique, as well as Guinea and Cape Verde, Port the Portuguese occupied the lands. That was settler colonialism at, at stake, right? The armed guerrilla struggle against Portuguese colonialism began September 1964, 65, right? Filimo was by far the most active group militarily. This is very crucial. Filimo had 100 to 250 men of officer potential trained in guerrilla tactics for three to six months period, three to six month periods in Algeria, the UAR, Communist China, or the USSR. The reason why I say this is so critical is because you can see clearly, right, a, a direct manifestation of a global critical awareness. Mozambique and Filimo understood the struggle cannot be limited to the the confines in which they they physically occupied right you you can't you can't limit your struggle to geography and say well we're mozambique so why would we want to go anywhere besides mozambique no they understood okay we need to train our our soldiers right in places where they can be properly trained that 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 go beyond just where we are geographically the Revolutionary Army weakened Portugal, and after the country's coup in 1974, the Portuguese were forced to leave Mozambique. The new revolutionary government, led by Michel, took over on June 25th, 1975. He became the independent. He became independent Mozambique's first president, and was affectionately referred to as President Samoa. He put his revolutionary principles into action, into practice. As a Marxist, he called for the nationalization, which is government ownership, of Portuguese plantations and property. He moved quickly to have the Filimo government establish public schools and health clinics for the poor. He called for Filimo to organize itself into a Leninist party. He supported and allowed revolutionaries fighting white minority regimes in Rhodesia and South Africa to operate within Mozambique. Again, here we have another, dem uh, here we have another demonstration of global critical consciousness and awareness. So not only did Filimo train their officers in other countries, once they earned their independence, they allowed other militaries to fight and train, right, and operate within their territory. Um, so now, moving on to neocolonialism, right? Um, again, just the basics, this is by no means a, an in-depth um, analysis, right? The essence of colonialism is that the state, which is subject to it, is in theory independent and has all the outward trappings of international sovereignty. In reality, its economic system and thus its political policy is directed from the outside. This comes from Kwame Nkrumah in his book titled, Neocolonialism, The Last Stage of Imperialism. The result of neocolonialism is that foreign capital is used for the exploitation rather than, rather than for the development of the less developed parts of the world. Investment under neocolonialism increases rather than decreases the gap between the rich and the poor countries of the world. 
It is also the worst form of imperialism. For those who practice it, it means power without responsibility. And for those who suffer from it, it means exploitation without redress. In the days of old fashioned colonialism, the imperial power had at least to explain and justify at home who was taking abroad. In the colony, those who served the ruling imperial power could at least look to its protection against any violent move by their opponents. With neocolonialism, neither is the case. It is a greater danger to independent countries than is colonialism. Colonialism is crude, essentially overt, and apt to be overcome by a purposeful concert, concert of national effort. In neocolonialism, however, the people are divided from their leaders, and instead of providing true leadership and guidance, leaders come to neglect the very people who put them in power and incautiously become instruments of suppression on behalf of the neocolonialists. It is the people who suffer the depredations and indignities of colonialism, and the people must not be ins insulted by the dangerous flirtations with neocolonialism. The underlying message here is that neocolonialism is very real and is in many ways worse than colonialism was, right? The reason why neocolonialism is being discussed here is that there is this, um, there is this flawed idea, particularly um, among the masses here in America, right? That, oh yeah, we, we going back to Africa. We, that's all we gotta do is get there to the motherland and, and we'll be all right. The African continent is ravaged with neocolonialism across the entire continent. By no means is Africa as a place today uh, uh, rid of colonialism and imperialism. Again, as, as, as stated by our ancestors, right, Kwame and Kuma in particular, right, neocolonialism is a greater danger than colonialism is. What you have are leaders, it says right here, leaders that neglect the masses of their people, right, and, and they wield power indiscriminately, right, without responsibility. So what you have now, Africa is a continent ravaged with neocolonialism. What you have now are countries like China who, who see an opportunity, right? They see, they see the window opening, right, for infiltration, for investment, right, for, for opportunity for themselves, which is, um, which is allowed by the bourgeois African leadership, right, at the expense of the masses of African people. So again, by studying neocolonialism, we can dismantle the idea that all we gotta do as black people is just go to Africa. That isn't true, right? right? If, if we seriously organized around that, we would show up in Africa and be sorely disappointed, right? Thomas Sankara says that in essence, neocolonial and colonial societies are not the slightest bit different. The colonial administration was replaced a neocolonial administration identical to its predecessor. The colonial army was replaced by a neocolonial army with the same characteristics, functions, and the same role of guardian of the interests of imperialism and its national allies. The colonial school was replaced by a neocolonial school which set about the same objects of alienating our children from our country and reproducing a society devoted to imperialist interests and to serving the footmen and local allies of imperialism. We can think of neocolonialism, to give a, 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 an analogy or a metaphor, we can think of neocolonialism as the um, new paint job on the, um, the new paint job on the house with no plumbing and no electricity and ventilation and it's really an inhumane house to live in, right? So if the house um, itself is colonialism, neocolonialism is simply a new paint job, right? It, it's simply uh, um, dressing it up a particular way, as Kwame Nkrumah said, right? To make it appear that it has the, the, the outward trappings of sovereignty and independence. Oh yeah, they have a, you know, a, a, a democratic, um, elections process and they have this and they have that. No, they're an independent state. While in reality, right, it is nothing more than a neo-colonial society and all of the institutions and organizations have simply been replaced, right, by neo-colonial ones that are still controlled by those colonial powers. This becomes very crucial for us to, to, to recognize and to understand, again, when we engage in conversations, particularly among Black 
in the United States, right? That all we gotta do is go back to the continent, to the motherland. Yeah. While um emotionally, that's a sound argument, right? And 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 uh, theoretically, the political and economic realities, right, of the African continent should should signal to us that there is much more work to do in the eradication of neocolonialism before we can actually immigrate to the continent in mass. And we will end um, with a teaching from an ancestor. This is by far one of my favorites um, to, to recite, to memorize, to read <laughs> um, for motivation, what have you, um, because I, I believe it really just embodies, again, we talk about this critical synthesis, this critical synthesis between theory and practice, right? So more Michelle says that production is a school because it, because it is one of the sources of our knowledge and it is through production that we correct our mistakes. It is by going to the people that we both learn and teach them. We are in the habit of saying that it is in the war that we learn war, which means in fact that it is by carrying out a revolution that, that one learns how to carry, to carry out a revolution better. That it is by fighting that we learn to fight better and that it is by producing that we learn to produce better. We can study a lot, but what use is tons of knowledge if not taken to the masses if we do not produce? This critical question needs to be uh, uh, expressed, right? And, and answered by ourselves as individuals as well as among us as a collective, particularly when it comes to those of us who, who had the access to um, higher education, right? Who had the, the access to uh, uh, educational opportunities that the masses of our people do not have. The question becomes, if we study a lot, if we theorize a lot, and we come up with all of these, you know, um, complex and in-depth analyses of the of the inhuman living conditions of the poor working class masses, what good is that study and that theory, right, and that knowledge if it is not taken to the masses of the people to first teach them and then to inspire them and ourselves, right, all of us as a collective, right, to transform our material conditions, right, if we don't produce, right, you don't, um, you don't, uh, prepare for an examination for an exam in, in school, right? Um, to just take and then not care what the results were. Nobody does that. We study and we prepare and produce, right? In order to, to, to receive a result. That same uh, logic needs to be applied when we are talking about going to college and studying our people and getting these degrees and all of these different accolades, right? But we, we seem to um, lose sight of the danger, right, behind simply studying a lot and not taking that study and that knowledge to the masses and producing from it. That should always be the objective, right? Not just of, of, of those of us with, you know, that have access to higher education, but all of us as African Black people, right? Um, so that wraps up um, this month's lesson, PE with ABC revolutionary organizing African independence movements. Um, I, want, I would like to thank, oh, let me stop sharing my screen, there we go. Um, I'd like to thank each and every one of you all for tuning in. It is always an honor of mine um, to, to, you know, at the very least contribute to, as Samuel Michelle says, right, the production of knowledge um, and the exchange of it, right, among African people. Um, it's an honor that I don't take lightly. I take very seriously. You know, it, it isn't just, um, you know, hopping on Zoom and, and, you know, teaching for an hour and some change. I believe that it's very critical work that, that is being done and, and was done, right, by mighty ancestors before me, right, and, and, you know, God willing, by those yet to come, right, by future Africans. Um, so with that being said, um, you all will receive an email um, shortly after this um, that contains a post evaluation of this lesson. So please take, it takes no more than two minutes to complete. Um, so please uh, fill that out. That helps us um, identify, um, that helps us identify the uh, ways in which we can improve as a program, right? How we can do better, what worked, what didn't work, all that good stuff, um, you know, be, because we, we, we never, 
want to arrive at a place or believe we have arrived at a place where we are above critique, right? That, that, that's never the case. Um, so again, you'll receive an email of the post evaluation um, shortly. So please complete that. Um, and then hopefully we will continue to be engaged with you in not just PE with ABC, but overall African Black Coalition programming. With that, I will say peace, Black power to all you beautiful African people. Peace.